Okay, oh, it's all good. <coughs> Recording goes well. So let's uh, start uh, this uh, final part that is uh, dedicated to uh, packet switching and uh, buffering. <coughs> and so we have uh, so far uh, explored the architecture of uh, the routers. Uh, we have uh, uh, explored in depth uh, the network processor by talking about address lookup and packet classification. And in the first part of the course, we have also talked about the switching architecture, so about the switching fabric. Uh, now we are going to look inside this other module, which is called the traffic manager, where basically you have the functions that interfaces, that interface uh, uh, the line cards with the switch, uh, the switching fabric and also manage uh, all the uh, buffering that is needed when you, we are talking about uh, packet switching. So in this uh, part we will look at uh, some fundamental concepts uh, and uh, we will review uh, the switching, uh, briefly review the switching uh, theory when uh, we are talking about packet switching and not by uh, about uh, circuit switching. And uh, we also review the different buffering strategies and buffering architectures that uh, can be adopted in a switching fabric, in a packet switch, or in a router if you want. And then uh, we will briefly look at the performance of uh, some of these architectures uh, without going too much into the details about um, mathematics. Uh, but you will find the details uh, at the end of these slide sets if you want to uh, get a deeper understanding. They are not required, however, in the course. So, uh, first of all, let's uh, talk about some fundamental concepts. Uh, we will uh, uh, consider a new uh, performance parameter, which is uh, actually two new performance parameters. The first one is the throughput of the switching fabric. Uh, the throughput can be defined as uh, uh, the ratio of the aggregate, uh, uh, the average aggregate output rate. Uh, that means uh, the total output rate uh, <coughs> taken from all the possible outputs, uh, out, uh, output ports uh, of the switch, uh, averaged uh, uh, over time. And uh, so the throughput is the ratio between this uh, average output rate. Uh, and uh, the average aggregated input rate, so everything that comes into the, the switch. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, we, we are talking about uh, throughput, but there is an alternative possibility, that is to uh, normalize the output rate uh, to the maximum switch capacity. This is uh, sometimes called the throughput as well. Uh, so in some other cases, it's uh, called the processor traffic normalized processor traffic. <laughs> and, but in any case, bo both these measures, uh, uh, these uh, performance metrics, uh, give an idea of what is uh, the capability of the, uh, of the switch, uh, of the switching node to uh, <coughs> deliver packets that are coming from the inputs uh, towards the outputs. And uh, of course, so the most relevant conditions when, when uh, usually we want to measure these uh, performance metrics. Uh, it uh, corresponds to the, the situation when uh, all the uh, input ports uh, are loaded with the maximum possible traffic. That means that uh, the input uh, uh, lines, uh, the lines that are terminated at that switch, are always working at the line rate. Uh, so in the in, in ideal conditions, the behavior of throughput or process of traffic uh, in a, in a, a switch uh, can be represented by these uh, graphs. So here you have uh, the off-red traffic, which can be measured uh, in terms of uh, input rate uh, normalized to the maximum input rate capacity, that is the, the, the sum of the uh, capacities of, of all the input lines. And uh, you can see here that uh, one is the uh, corresponds to uh, one corresponds to a fully loaded uh, switch. And uh, so in terms of uh, throughput, uh, in the ide ideal case, everything that comes into the switch is uh, always uh, processed, so it's taken out. 
and uh, so this uh, uh, the throughput should uh, be one always until you reach the maximum input capacity of the switch then of course when you are uh, incrementing <coughs> the traffic over the maximum possibility of uh, getting traffic into the switch the throughput will tend to to to, the, to uh, reduce uh, and on the other side you have the processing uh, process of traffic uh, in the ideal conditions as uh, every, uh, when everything that comes in always gets out uh, here you would have uh, an increasing uh, slope constant slope until the maximum capacity of, uh, until you reach the maximum capacity of the switch and then uh, uh, here everything outside is uh, busy so all the <laughs> um, uh, output uh, lines uh, are always busy so then you cannot go any further <clears throat> usually w the, the green point corresponds to uh, the conditions where you want to measure throughput and process and traffic this is the ideal case uh, however it's not always possible to uh, achieve these conditions in some uh, architectures as we will see uh, the maximum throughput is actually <coughs> uh, when, or, or the throughput measured when the, the offered traffic is one, is actually less than one because uh, there are several reasons why uh, you can have uh, that. Uh, not all the traffic will go goes out uh, in, uh, <coughs> uh, in, in from the switch. Then uh, there is another parameter that is uh, very important. We have already mentioned it. It's uh, the speed up. It's called the speed up factor. And uh, in, in this factor is, uh, uh, measures the, the uh, internal forwarding rate of the switch fabric. And uh, it is uh, always the internal forwarding rate uh, normalized to uh, the input line rate. And uh, so when uh, you have a certain value of key, then uh, uh, the switching fabric is able to uh, forward uh, uh, an, an integer number of packets, uh, which is uh, always the maximum less than key, in the same time slot, assuming that all the packets arrive in the same in a, in a time slot. And uh, uh, so you usually, uh, when you introduce a speed up, this is done to alleviate output port contention that uh, results uh, w because uh, here we are talking about uh, packet switching so it may occur that uh, several uh, input uh, packets uh, are all destined to the same output port uh, so obviously uh, we, uh, if you have this situation in order to uh, transfer all the packets uh, in uh, the same time slot uh, you need uh, to introduce a speed up and when you introduce the speed up at that, uh, in that situation, the output line that is uh, connected to the switching fabric uh, will uh, work at a higher speed than uh, the uh, output uh, uh, termination, the, um, the transmitter, the transmitter, so the uh, connection to the other switches. And so here you need a buffer to compensate this uh, mismatch uh, of uh, rates. Well, in this case, for example, a switching fabric, the, the speed up factor is equal to three. Uh, is, uh, we have also uh, studied uh, the blocking uh, properties of the switching fabrics. And uh, as uh, we have already mentioned earlier, well, all that theory was uh, to understand the internal blocking of the switch. So the, uh, basically, as we know, the switch is uh, internally non-blocking when we are always able to connect an idle input to an idle output <laughs> without uh, having an internal contention of some uh, internal, uh, internal uh, network element. Uh, idle input and idle output means uh, ports that are not used or not connected. Uh, typically, the uh, uh, non-blocking uh, architecture is the crossbar, but we have seen other architectures that can be blocking. For example, this is a Banyan network, the de Delta network, and you can see here that you have uh, an internal collision if you want to set up uh, two paths 
even if they are going to the two different uh, output ports. And this is another architecture. Uh, here uh, you find uh, in the book also this figure. It says a closed network. Actually, we know that this is not exactly a closed network. It's a fully connected network with th three stages, but it, it's uh, undersized in terms of clocks, because otherwise here if you want a real closed network, you should have uh, five uh, matrices in the intermediate stage instead of three. But in this case, when you have only three matrices in the intermediate stage, the architecture becomes uh, blocked. For example, in this case, if you want to connect uh, in, uh, the ideal inlet uh, nine with either uh, four or, si or six, which are both uh, idle, you cannot because uh, there is a contention, an internal contention on that link. <coughs> uh, internal uh, contention uh, can be uh, related to any switch, but in case of uh, packet switching, we have also to consider output port contention, and it is the situation when uh, different uh, uh, input ports. Uh, uh, have packets that are going to the same uh, output port simultaneously and so you have blocking or conflict which is not due to an internal uh, architecture, an internal uh, contention but uh, it's due to the, uh, to the output port contention and uh, the capability of uh, solving these situations of output port contention greatly affects the uh, utilization of the switching fabric and typically, if you uh, have output port contention, as we have mentioned, one of the techniques is to introduce a speed-up factor, uh, which allows to transfer more than one packet to the uh, same output port uh, in, uh, the sa at the same time. Um, if you have uh, a speed-up factor of uh, H, uh, then you can uh, solve the contention of up to H input port requests. Uh, if you have actually the key uh, uh, input ports that are containing the same output port uh, and the uh, key is larger than H, so your speed up is not enough to solve all these contentions, uh, then you can uh, do two things. One is to dis uh, discard some of the uh, key packets and actually, you will have to discard uh, uh, actually uh, key minus h. No, sorry, the, the speed up is key, and the, the number of packets that are contending is h. So if uh, h is larger than, than key, you will have to discard uh, h minus key packets. Uh, or otherwise, the other possibility is to use input port buffers where you can temporarily store these uh, H minus key uh, packets waiting to be transferred in, a, in, an, in another time slot. Uh, packet scheduling is the function that uh, uh, allows uh, uh, the node or the router to uh, <coughs> control all these uh, the buffers, and, but also to arbitrate uh, contentions when uh, you have to, uh, you can transfer only a subset of the packets that are contending for an, an output port or maybe also for an internal link. And uh, so you have to decide which of, the, uh, of these packets will be transferred and uh, uh, instead which uh, of, the remaining or of the remaining packets uh, will have to be stored in some internal buffer or be discarded. So we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, solutions for these problems uh, and many uh, schemes have been uh, proposed and studied and evaluated, especially considering, as we will see in a minute, that uh, uh, we have the possibility of placing the buffering uh, hardware in different locations inside the switch. And uh, usually all these schemes are uh, compared by uh, considering performance parameters like uh, the throughput, the uh, probability of uh, packet loss, uh, but also the, per the complexity and implementation cost because uh, many of these uh, scheduling schemes uh, are very complicated. <coughs> 
Um, <clears throat> we have to, to uh, introduce a scheduling uh, each time we have uh, the contentious at the input, but we can also introduce a scheduling at the output each time we have uh, output buffers and uh, the rate of the switching fabric is higher than the rate of the uh, output lines and uh, so uh, in uh, uh, the output uh, buffers we can adopt simple simple uh, policies like first in first out but we can do also something more sophisticated and for example uh, uh, <coughs> let's say giving and we can give priority to certain packets when they belong to a given flow uh, uh, compared to other packets that uh, <coughs> uh, belong to other flows, so to implement quality of service policies. Uh, when we have uh, the circuit switching, basically we have no output port contention, and uh, so the uh, internal blocking uh, usually must be prevented. And uh, this is uh, uh, basically always true because uh, uh, circuit switchings, in circuit switching you have uh, permanent connections or connections that are changing uh, at, uh, in a time uh, uh, scale which is very different from uh, uh, the packet time scale. And uh, so if you um, want to, if you have conflicts and uh, if you have uh, contentions of resources, um, you cannot solve them with buffers because buffers, uh, whenever, whenever, however you do them uh, large, will get uh, uh, congested very soon you know, because uh, the connections are very uh, long lasting. And uh, so the only solution is to try to avoid the contentions uh, <coughs> in the, uh, internal contentions. Ex out of core contentions are already eliminated because in circuit switching makes no sense uh, requiring that uh, two circuits go to the same output. So usually when you have circuit switching, uh, the fabric reconfiguration time is uh, uh, quite, uh, <coughs> say, oh, the, the fabric reconfiguration rate is quite uh, uh, um, low. Uh, if we consider, let's say, telephone uh, conversations or circuit switch that applies apply to the old telephone service. Average connections uh, uh, usually last about uh, three minutes. So if you have an N by N switch <coughs> and you have uh, N contentions that are simultaneously arriving to the, to the switch, uh, each of them must be um, uh, must be uh, managed in a time scale which is relatively long if you consider 180 seconds which is uh, the uh, duration of the, of the conversation and you divide it by n which is the number of requests you get uh, 180 milliseconds per connection and uh, so this is not a very demanding uh, uh, speed for many electronic uh, switch, switch implementations and moreover, you can uh, you usually have a centralized processor which uh, finds uh, uh, manages the connections, finds all the routes uh, and the uh, routing for all the connections between the uh, input and output ports. With, with packet switching, the situation is uh, quite different. You can have uh, output port contentions, and uh, you can. Uh, accept internal, on the other side, you can accept the internal uh, contentions because you need buffers. So buffers uh, are needed in any case to uh, solve output per contentions. Since you have buffers, you can exploit, uh, again, buffers also to solve uh, internal blockings. So it, it is not uh, very important that uh, the switching architecture is uh, strictly non-blocking as in the case of the packet switch, yeah, circuit switching. However, the reconfiguration time of the fabric is uh, uh, much shorter. Uh, if you consider uh, the typical uh, uh, length of the smallest uh, IP packet is 64 bytes, uh, um, let's say, or four, 40 bytes is the minimum, but 64 with some margin. Uh, in a 
10 gigabit per second line, this means that uh, each slot is about uh, 50 nanoseconds in duration. So every 50 nanoseconds you have to reconfigure the whole uh, switch. And uh, <coughs> so as uh, the line bit rate increases and the number of switching ports also increases, the time that you have for uh, manage each uh, uh, packet is very short. <coughs> Centralized processors are very often uh, uh, imply, uh, used also for packet switching, uh, but uh, if the switch is very large, then they become impractical and they can be replaced by uh, distributed control schemes, uh, for example, exploiting the self-routing capability of uh, the switching fabrics. Uh, in packet switching, you can have also the uh, multicast uh, um, connection, and uh, this is, for example, is uh, uh, required when you have, uh, uh, let's say, audio or video connections like uh, audio conference uh, with, that involves a pool of uh, participants. In multicast, uh, the node that receives the packet uh, not only has to forward it to a single output, but it has to replicate it and forward it to a, a subset of uh, the outputs. <coughs> so this is an, an extra uh, <coughs> complexity that you have in, uh, um, in uh, uh, packet switching. Uh, the operation of uh, packet switching, uh, of, packet, of uh, packet switches, uh, basically can be of two types. You have uh, cell mode switchings, uh, switches that uh, operates on a, a fixed size packets. Uh, and uh, usually uh, you, you will have uh, these kind of switches uh, always uh, when uh, uh, some protocols are adopted uh, for the transport of packets in the network, like for example ATM. ATM is a uh, asynchronous transfer mode, is a protocol that is not uh, used uh, anymore uh, extensively, but it was very much used in the past. And uh, it's a layer two, layer three protocol. So it always uh, it also tells you how to transmit uh, packets and the, for the, pack the format of the packets. And uh, um, in a different way as uh, IP, ATM is based on uh, fixed uh, size packets, which are called cells. So when you have uh, a switch for uh, an ATM network, you will always have uh, fixed size uh, packets. Uh, but in IP world, uh, packets are of variable length, uh, and uh, so you may want your switching system to uh, act uh, on these uh, variable length packets. And in, this, in that case, uh, the switching mode would, is called a purely packet mode. But uh, usually you have something that is uh, intermediate. We have already mentioned it uh, earlier. Uh, you may want to operate a switching fabric in a, a, a cell mode so that the switching fabric always uh, operate uh, on fixed size packets. Uh, but um, uh, this can be used in a, in a network that is supporting a protocol uh, that is instead based on uh, variable size packets. Like for example, a router which has to manage IP packets. So in this case, uh, there are some uh, extra blocks that are added. Uh, one is the, called the uh, input segmentation module. And uh, this input segmentation module is uh, a buffer that accumulates uh, the arriving packets, which are variable length, and converts them into fixed size cells. Uh, so it, if the conversion is quite simple. You take uh, uh, the... Um, when, when you have, uh, say, a packet that is more than uh, the size of one cell, you, you uh, take a, a certain number of cells that uh, will be fully loaded with data, and then uh, the last cell may be loaded partially with data, and then uh, loaded with uh, extra stuffing uh, uh, nonsense bits. <coughs> uh, so the uh, ISM, the input segmentation module, uh, convert packets into fixed cells, and then cells are stored, may be stored in an input uh, buffer, uh, that uh, it will be a cell-based buffer, so storing always uh, uh, equal size packets. 
Um, here you can see uh, this buffer architecture is uh, uh, based on the virtual output queue uh, concept that I, we have not introduced yet, but we will see it in a minute. Uh, and then uh, once the packets are uh, cells are stored here, <coughs> they are transferred into the switching fabric. The switching fabric operates on a time slotted uh, way because uh, uh, you have uh, all the packets that all the uh, same length. And so the reconfiguration of the switching fabric uh, can occur in uh, uh, at regular intervals. Then once the cells are transferred uh, uh, at the output of the, of the switching fabric, before transferring the cells into uh, the network, uh, you have this uh, output reassembly module, which takes uh, the cells and converts them back <coughs> to uh, packets, reassembling cells that are belonging to the same packet uh, in the same packet. Then these packets are queued in a, a buffer. This output port uh, buffer will be operated on a variable packet, uh, uh, variable packet length base. Uh, and then uh, they are transmitted in an output line. Uh, <clears throat> usually, the, the cells are uh, switched by this uh, switching fabric as individual, uh, as, as individual entities. Uh, if, uh, if the switching fabric does not uh, uh, realize that uh, different cells belong to the same original packet, then you will have a further problem here at the output that would be to uh, reorder the cells of the same packet in a suitable way. So identify, identify all the cells that belong to the same packet and reorder them so that you can reconstruct the packet. And this may take time, uh, so the uh, complexity in the uh, output reassembly module. So maybe an alternative is to um, operate the switching fabric in a packet mode uh, switching way. It means that uh, uh, the switching fabric will be aware of the fact that different cells belong to the same original packet and they will be scheduled to cross the switching fabric in order in, a, in an order way so that they will come at the output of the switching fabric already uh, in a, the correct order. So you don't have to uh, <coughs> reorder uh, the cells in this uh, output reassembly module. Uh, obviously, in this case, uh, um, the algorithm of scheduling and uh, of the, co the control of the switching fabric will be more complicated because you have to take into account that uh, different cells be belong to the same uh, to the same packet. So there is a, a, always a trade-off between uh, the complexity of the scheduling and switching algorithm and uh, the complexity of the output reassembly modules. <clears throat> so now let's focus uh, more on the packet switching fabric features. And uh, if, if we can classify the uh, switching fabrics uh, in, based on their architecture in a, a similar way that we have seen uh, in uh, the case uh, in a case of uh, uh, circuit switching. But however, in this case, we, it doesn't make sense uh, to consider uh, the blocking properties because uh, uh, the, distinct, the distinction between uh, uh, the arrangeable and strictly non-blocking makes a little sense and, because, uh, and also, as we said, we can use buffers to compensate possible internal blockings. So the classification about the blocking properties is not uh, the best uh, we can use uh, for uh, packet switching. Um, you have also to take into account that uh, uh, rearrangeability and uh, strict sense non-blocking uh, lose uh, sense because here you have, uh, if you imagine that the switching fabric operates on a, a time slot based, you have to rearrange the switching fabric at each uh, time slot. Okay, so even if you have a, a, a rearrangeable architecture that is rearrangeable in uh, the uh, circuit switching applications, you can uh, use it uh, uh, 
well in, in these applications for packet switching uh, because in any case you have to rearrange at each time slot. So spending more uh, to make architecture strictly non-blocking is not uh, needed in, uh, for the packet switching applications. Uh, the classification of packet switches instead should be based on uh, uh, the type of uh, um, <coughs> um, technique that uh, you can use to uh, share uh, the, the switching fabric by different inputs and different outputs. And so here we will have the first, uh, the first group that is based on time division multiplexing, another group on space division multiplexing. And then uh, uh, for the space division multiplexing cases, you can have a single path or multipath, and then many different implementations, uh, architectures to implement uh, all the cases. If uh, we want to use the time division switching, basically what happens is that uh, the cells uh, that are coming from different inputs are all multiplexed uh, together and then forwarded through a data path that connects all the inputs to uh, all the outputs and then they will find then uh, the correct uh, output and you can do this in two different ways first is uh, uh, we can use uh, a shared memory so uh, the multiplexing uh, say component is the uh, RAM, the random access memory uh, all, all the cells that are coming to the packet are all stored in the RAM and then they are read according to what is the specific output for each uh, packet. The other alternative is to use uh, a, a time division bus that can be linear bus or a ring as you want. In this case, uh, this is the multiplexing component, so the bus. Uh, so all the packets that are arriving to the switch are uh, conveyed through the bus, multiplex on the bus, and then assigned to the different uh, output ports. <coughs> this is basically uh, the case when you are using time division in order to, uh, to, to, to manage different packets in the same time slot. The alternative is to uh, instead use uh, space division and uh, in this case, uh, you need uh, multiple uh, paths between uh, inputs and output ports. Cells from different uh, input and output connections are, can be forwarded at the same time, uh, when, of course, there is no blocking uh, that is present. And uh, you can distinguish uh, the, these uh, architectures according to the number of paths, of possible paths that you have between uh, an input-output pair which is basically the channel graph that we have already introduced uh, at the beginning when we talked about uh, switching theory. So for example, here you have uh, the crossbar and the fully con and uh, crossbar tree, the architectures we have already introduced uh, in a general speaking uh, context. Um, these are single paths uh, and uh, you don't have internal blocking, but you also have uh, single path between each input and each output. Uh, this is also a single path architecture, Banyan case. We have seen that uh, in the Banyan networks you always have a single path and this is also a property that you can exploit uh, to implement uh, self-routing. And then uh, uh, the multipath architectures. You can build the multipath architectures in several ways. If you start from uh, a Banyan network, you can add stages horizontally or stack different uh, planes of Banyan stages vertically using then uh, the um, switch, um, splitters and combiners at the end. Uh, or you can, or you can uh, uh, build uh, uh, fully interconnected architectures like the Gloss network that we have uh, studied or other more strange implementations like the recirculating uh, switch that is uh, a way to uh, send packets that are, cannot go directly to the specific uh, output into this recirculation ring and uh, so you can uh, uh, compensate contentions also in this way. And this is a multipath because the, 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 you have the direct path 
the path with a single recirculation, the path with two recirculations, and so on and so forth. Now, this is uh, basically uh, all uh, again uh, uh, related to the switching part. Now, let's uh, get into the buffering um, hardware. And uh, we are going to review the different possibilities when, uh, uh, by which we can use buffers in order to uh, achieve a good performance in uh, the switching fabrics. And uh, so the, if, uh, the first uh, use of the buffer, which is basically also coincident with uh, a time division implementation of the switch, is to use a single memory element. And uh, so in this uh, case, uh, when you have uh, the input uh, packets that arise uh, here in this time slot, uh, here you have uh, these, uh, um, say, circles that represent, they represent the packets. And uh, these uh, colored squares represent the outputs. So the code, uh, the color code is that uh, the color of this packet indicates uh, the destined uh, output, so uh, destination output. So the blue has to go to this output, so the uh, red uh, must go the here, and the green in this, in this uh, other output. So what happens in this case? Uh, the packets are stored into the memory. And uh, instead of having a simple first in, first out uh, uh, queue, uh, we can have several logical queues in the memory. Each, of the, uh, each one of these uh, logical queues is uh, related to a specific output. So basically, the, the, the um, packets that can be forwarded immediately are sent out. Packets that uh, have to be stored because the output port is uh, occupied are uh, stored in the, the appropriate uh, uh, logical uh, memory. And so now there is a new um, time slot, and this is what happens to the new packets. And then finally, the last one is uh, taken into the output. Um, so in this case, we can uh, manage uh, the. We, we, we can locate all the uh, packets in a single memory. We have this uh, logical architecture based on uh, n different uh, queues, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so we have the, and, uh, the advantage of uh, sharing uh, the same uh, uh, component uh, by all the input ports and the output ports. Uh, but uh, we have the pro a problem because we must be able to write up to n packets simultaneously into the memory and to read up to n packets out of the memory in the same time slot. So we have a, a, a simple memory like the one that we use in our PC probably would not be enough because we need something that allows a concurrent writing process and concurrent reading process, which is probably not so easy to, to implement. So in this case, uh, um, this, this way of implementing buffers uh, works well if the size of the switch is not uh, very high and also if the lines the, the rate of the lines uh, are not uh, very high. Second possibility, output queuing. Uh, so we are placing all the buffer capacity at uh, the output of the switching fabric. And uh, this means that the cells that are, uh, have to be sent out uh, on a specific output port are immediately sent to the output port, like in the previous situation, the two red uh, cells are both sent in, in the same time slot in the output port. Then one is stored in the output queue and the other one is transmitted. At the same time, the, the other cell is sent to the blue output. And then this is what happens when you have the next time slot. Um, so the advantage here is that uh, you have uh, uh, the possibility of uh, achieving high performance, uh, you have uh, a quality of service, uh, the possibility of implementing quality of service, uh, service control by arbitrating or scheduling the transmission out of this queue. If you want to implement, uh, instead of a simple FIFO, 
other more sophisticated techniques is possible. Drawback, uh, again here we have to uh, be able to read or uh, write, uh, write, not read, but write uh, multiple cells in this buffer memory at the same time. So we have the um, multiple uh, writing uh, implementation and moreover we must uh, uh, in, adopt uh, a speed up factor in the switching fabric because uh, uh, you have to transfer more than one cell uh, more, more than one uh, packet at the same uh, in the same time slot another possibility locate buffers at the input so when packets arrive to the uh, to the uh, switching fabric if you have an output port contention you will store the packets at the input of the switching fabric and um, <clears throat> the switching fabric has no speed up factor it means that it's, it's able to transfer one cell per input output pair per each time slot maximum one cell and uh, so this is what uh, happens in the usual case the two red packets that arrive at the input uh, have to be both sent to the output, uh, first output. One of the two is uh, forwarded, the other one is stored, but it is stored in the input queue of uh, the uh, input line where this packet came from. So when you have a, uh, the arrival of other two packets, uh, Assume again you have a contention of two red packets. If you assume that the first one can be forwarded, this second remains stored here and it will block the green packet that is uh, uh, going to another output. And this is basically the head of the line blocking, which is uh, the main drawback of uh, this architecture. Okay. So this architecture is uh, scalable, you can use it for large switches, does not suffer from the switching size limitations, but uh, it has this head-of-the-line blocking problem. We have already seen uh, this example, uh, this is uh, again uh, the head-of-the-line. So the head-of-the-line uh, blocking happens when uh, the uh, queued cells at the front of uh, the queue prevents other cells in the queue uh, from moving forward even if the destined uh, output port is free and so the consequence is that the output port that is free remains unused okay? even if there is something that is uh, should go from this output port for that for this specific time slot this output port remains idle and this means that you have a decrease in the throughput so in, when you adopt this technology uh, this architecture throughput is uh, limited compared to the uh, output port case. How can we solve the problem of uh, head of the line blocking uh, but still using a switching fabric with uh, uh, no speed up factor? There is a way, and uh, this solution is called a virtual output queuing. This, the concept is uh, similar to what we have seen uh, in the first uh, case of the implementation. So instead of uh, using a, a simple uh, first in, first out queue in each buffer, uh, we, we buffer packets in a, in a memory, but uh, implementing a logical structure with uh, uh, a number of different uh, logical queues inside the same, implemented in the same uh, physical uh, buffer and uh, spe uh, more specifically we need uh, n uh, logical queues if we have n outputs so what happens uh, when you implement this architecture again we take the same case so now the two uh, red uh, um, packets are contending for the red output <coughs> one is stored Again, as in the previous case, is stored in uh, this uh, input buffer. The other one is forwarded. But uh, when uh, we have uh, the, the arrival in the next time slot, assuming that, again, we have a contention for the red output port, and again, uh, this packet here loses the contention. So this packet is forwarded. 
but the green packet that is stored here in this buffer is not stopped because it will be stored in a different logical queues in a different log logical queue so since uh, the buffer is uh, idle here the packet that is stored in a sorry the output is idle the packet that is stored in a different logical queue can be fetched and transferred to the output okay uh, the hardware that you need is exactly the same as in the input uh, queuing scheme but uh, uh, by using scheduling, so by differentiating, the, giving diver, different priorities to packets that are stored in the buffers, you can overcome the head-of-the-line blocking problem. So you eliminate the head-of-the-line blocking problem, but you need to manage these uh, virtual queues. So there is a complexity that is transferred to the scheduling algorithm. And in particular, when you have uh, <coughs> uh, this architecture, then you again you have to make a choice, deciding which packet will be transferred in a certain time slot and which instead will remain inside the input queues. And uh, so, since uh, here you have uh, uh, this uh, um, <coughs> more complicated architecture. You have to implement the scheduling decision and uh, uh, for instance one of the decisions that uh, must be taken is uh, when you have uh, several head of the line packets packets that are waiting at the head of these uh, buffers and waiting for the same output uh, so it, 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 as in the situation that we have seen uh, previously uh, like uh, like here you have this is this that is waiting and this that is coming and is contending for the same output and uh, you must take a decision on which of the two will be forwarded and uh, this is implies a scheduling decision here the, in the example that we have seen this uh, scheduling behavior is very unfair against uh, this packet here because this packet is uh, has been kept waiting one time and then another time okay so it's not uh, the most uh, the, the best uh, scheduling algorithm that you can uh, imagine so scheduling algorithm must be designed designed in a proper way and uh, the effect of uh, the scheduling decision has an impact on uh, the may have an impact on the throughput and uh, uh, so you have to find uh, the uh, solution the scheduling solution for each time slot uh, that is uh, uh, it maximize uh, the performance of the switch and this is not a simple problem okay there are some several uh, techniques that have been proposed uh, that allows you to solve this problem take into account performance throughput fairness implementation complexity and so on uh, other, another possibility is to combine uh, input and output uh, buffering and uh, so basically in this case you can uh, use the output buffer to alleviate uh, the head of the line blocking uh, problems uh, however in, instead of uh, uh, you, uh, having a speed up factor that is equal to n which guarantees you uh, maximum throughput uh, you can reduce the speed up factor and exploit the input buffers um, when uh, when it is needed. So this is basically the, the scheme. And uh, here you have uh, the speed up factor that will be uh, in, uh, between 1 and n. If you uh, use a speed up factor equal to n, then you can uh, remove the input uh, port, uh, the, the input buffers. If you, the speed of factor is one, you can remove the output port, the output buffers. If it is something in between, you can combine the use of the input and the output ports. And in this simple case, uh, input ports are managed as uh, first in, first out architectures. And it can be proven that uh, if you use a speed of factor of equal to four, in uh, most uh, working conditions, this architecture can achieve a throughput which is 99%. Cannot achieve exactly one, but it's 99%, uh, so uh, really high. 
something more sophisticated instead of having first uh, or just uh, FIFO buffers at the input you can still use the combination of input and output buffers but here at the input you can uh, use uh, virtual output queue a virtual output queuing mechanism uh, so now you have uh, uh, n virtual output queues in the input buffer um, but you have also some uh, capacity here at the output and in this case again the speed up is less than n something between 1 and, uh, and n and it, is, it has been uh, proven that uh, if you use a speed up factor of 2 so if you basically use here uh, an out, uh, output port buffers with the capability of holding two packets uh, then uh, you can achieve 100% throughput in almost all uh, traffic conditions so this is uh, uh, an interesting uh, solution that is also very uh, cost effective there are some other architectures that uh, implement buffering internally combined within the uh, switching fabric uh, for example you can implement uh, a crossbar and at each cross point in instead of uh, uh, implementing a simple switch 2x2 two two switch you can also create a buffer this is uh, uh, quite easy if you are uh, implementing this architecture on an elect electronic chip because uh, basically CMOS can be used also for buffering so in this case uh, you will have uh, this kind of uh, management uh, when you have uh, uh, packets that are contending for the same uh, output they will be placed uh, one, one will be forwarded the other one will be placed in the buffer but this buffer is uh, dedicated to that specific output and since it basically is also dedicated to that specific input so it's uh, like in uh, the crossbar switch the buffer is, uh, uh, is dedicated so when you have uh, another packet that is coming you, don't, you can avoid the head of the line blocking because it will go to uh, another, another buffer um, you can achieve the same performance as the uh, output queue uh, output, uh, output port uh, buffering because you don't have a uh, head of the line blocking uh, but uh, then you will have to manage uh, uh, n square buffers, small buffers, because uh, uh, you have to implement a buffer at each uh, cross point. And uh, so here uh, you are basically uh, spending a lot for uh, memory positions. Most of the time they will remain uh, idle, mm. but it's a possible alternative. So this is just a qualitative uh, uh, overview of all the possibilities uh, that uh, uh, you can use for uh, uh, de designing the buffer architecture in a uh, switching uh, node, in a packet switch. And uh, now we are going to look uh, at uh, some uh, uh, performance just to be able to compare the different architectures based on uh, uh, simple parameters like uh, uh, throughput, uh, uh, loss probability, packet loss probability, and uh, delay. So uh, first uh, we are going to uh, look into a very simple model, which is uh, the bufferless switch. So in this case we have a, a packet switching fabric. Uh, we can assume that uh, we don't have internal blocking. For example, we can uh, uh, refer to a, a crossbar but we will have output port contentions and uh, in this case we decide to uh, avoid any buffering um, hardware in this uh, implementation we want to uh, evaluate what, uh, what is uh, the performance in terms of average throughput of this architecture the analysis is quite uh, simple so you have uh, basically an n by n crossbar network we assume that uh, we have a random load that means that uh, we have traffic that is arriving to the input ports and uh, it is equally loading all the input ports so P is the input load uh, is the probability of having one packet at each input in a slot in a time slot 
Here, of course, we assume a, a, slot, a slotted uh, behavior, so uh, all the packets are of the same length. And then we can assume that uh, we have a uniform distribution of the destinations. So each packet that gets into this switch will have an equal probability to be destined to any of the outputs. And uh, therefore, the probability that the packet is destined for a specific output is 1 over n, where n is the number of outputs. Uh, what, when uh, we have an output that is uh, idle, basically an output is idle if in a specific slot there is no packet among those that are coming into the, uh, into the switch, which will request uh, to go to that specific output. So that is addressed to that specific output port. And uh, so the probability that uh, this occurs is given by 1 minus p over n uh, power n. And this is because uh, each packet arrives with the probability, um, sorry, is each uh, um, input port uh, will receive a packet with a probability which is uh, equal to uh, p. And then the probability that that packet is going to that specific output is 1 over n. So here we have p over n. And 1 minus p over n is the probability that the packet is not going to that specific output. Then we have n independent inputs. And so this is why we have to take the power n. Okay. So... If no output port is idle, it means that all the output ports are busy all the time, we reach throughput is equal to 1, because uh, uh, the output ports are always, uh, 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 always uh, uh, producing packets. What is the probability that we have uh, uh, throughput equal to 1? It will be uh, this expression here, so <coughs> it, uh, it will be 1 minus... Uh, this expression that is the probability that we found uh, previously. So this is also the throughput. The throughput is given by 1 minus uh, this expression here, which is a quite simple formula. And uh, uh, we can uh, take uh, the limit when n tends to be very large, so tends to inf infinite. And in this case, the throughput will be uh, 1 minus a power minus p. Uh, by minus e power minus p. e is the base of the natural uh, uh, logarithm, as you know. Uh, so this is basically uh, the throughput in the ideal condition when you have uh, a large switch. The dimension of the switch tends to be infinite. And uh, if you, uh, uh, if you uh, replace uh, 1 to p, so if, if uh, the initial p is equal to 1, it means that uh, we are in a, a fully loaded conditions, so you have uh, all the input ports that are always receiving packets, and is the uh, condition where, when uh, we want to measure the throughput, as I have uh, uh, mentioned earlier. So in this case, the maximum throughput will be 0 0.632. It is called also the switch, the switch capacity, the throughput when... Uh, you have a, a full load of uh, the inputs. Um, this is basically uh, the, the, the throughput that we have to consider. Uh, so the number of packets that can reach the output um, when, when we have these uh, uh, fully loaded conditions in each time slot. The average number of packets that reach the output in each time slot. Uh, we can calculate now also the packet loss probability because here we don't have buffers. So all the packets that are not going out are basically lost. And uh, the packet loss probability is given by 1 minus the throughput divided by P. It's normalized by the input uh, load. And uh, if you replace, uh, uh, so this is the expression, if you... Uh, consider p is equal to 1 and n that is going to infinite, uh, then this is the result. The packet loss probability would be 36.8%. Um, so this is basically the analysis when uh, uh, 
you have uh, an unbuffered uh, switch, all the loss is due to output port contention in this case because you don't have any internal blocking. Um, now we would like to extend this analysis also to uh, the output queuing scheme, the input queuing scheme and uh, the shared queuing scheme. And uh, this is not uh, trivial uh, because uh, uh, analysis is much more complicated. Uh, here we have buffers, so it's another thing. Um, in order to introduce uh, these, uh, um, these, the theorems that uh, allows you to calculate the throughput for these schemes, we have first uh, to understand how we can model the traffic because most of these theorems are, are uh, based on these uh, specific traffic models. So the easiest uh, uh, mo traffic model that we know is this Poisson process. I'm sure you have already uh, seen it in various uh, courses. Uh, it's a, basically a, a stochastic process where uh, you count uh, the number of events in a given time interval. And uh, you assume that uh, the time uh, uh, between uh, each pair of consecutive events uh, has an exponential distribution. Lambda, this is uh, the parameter of this exponential distribution, is also known as intensity. And uh, so the number of events that you can count from a, a time t to a time t plus tau, where tau is a, a given uh, time interval, follows a Poisson distribution. Um, that is uh, basically associated to the parameter lambda multiplied by tau. This is uh, uh, the expression. So where, when you are counting these events, uh, the probability that the number of events that you count is equal to key is given by this formula. Um, and uh, you can see immediately by this formula that uh, uh, the starting the, the, the starting instant of the counting process is uh, not relevant. So T does not appear here inside. And this is because, as you know, the Poisson process is a memoryless memory -less process. What happens in the next uh, tie, uh, tau uh, seconds does not depend on uh, what happened in the previous uh, seconds. So basically, this is uh, uh, the result. And uh, um, lambda is uh, the expected number of events uh, of, or uh, arrivals that occur per unit time. This is the meaning of, this, uh, of the intensity parameter. Uh, Poisson process is uh, used uh, to model several physical uh, processes, like, for example, uh, counting uh, the uh, photons uh, in an optical receiver um, and uh, basically it is uh, uh, a, a process of uh, uh, event counting where events uh, occurs uh, on uh, uh, um, on a continuous uh, timeline yes, they can occur at any time the Bernoulli process is uh, another process that instead uh, is used to characterize uh, um, events that occur in, uh, in uh, specific, uh, um, a specific specific instant, uh, and uh, so it is uh, more useful when you have uh, uh, to describe uh, an environment, for example, that is. Uh, that works on a, in a time slotted base because in time slotting you don't the time is not continuous but events occurs only on a specific uh, uh, on a finite number of a discrete number of, of uh, possible instants so the Bernoulli process basically is, uh, uh, is used to describe uh, the repetition of a random experiment when uh, you have uh, uh, only two possible outcomes, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, flipping the coin. If you flip the coin, you can have uh, only heads or tails that uh, can be success or failure according to what uh, have been agreed. And uh, 
So you, uh, if you have uh, a sequence of uh, identical and uh, um, independent uh, uh, trials, then this uh, um, is, uh, uh, creates a, a, a set of events that is described by the Bernoulli process. Trials are independent, so again this process is uh, memoryless, does not tell you anything about what will be the future result if you observe the previous uh, uh, occurrences. And uh, this is uh, uh, the expression of the probability of having uh, key uh, successes uh, in uh, n repetitions of the Bernoulli uh, trial. Uh, given the uh, parameter p, which is the probability of having success in any uh, Bernoulli trial. And uh, it is uh, uh, provided by this uh, binomial distribution with this uh, uh, binomial factor. If you have a, a very long uh, sequence of uh, coin flips, so n tends to infinite, this uh, distribution is approximated by a Gaussian distribution because of the theory of the, no, of the uh, central limit. So we can apply the Bernoulli uh, traffic model, uh, the Bernoulli model, uh, to describe uh, the process of arrival of packets uh, in a, uh, a switch because we, can, we assume that the switch operates on a slot-by-slot -slot, uh, uh, base. And uh, so, um, how can we describe it in terms of a Bernoulli trial? In each time slot and for each output, a Bernoulli trial corresponds to the fact that you have a success if the cell that arrived in that time slot uh, is destined, uh, if a cell that arrived in that time slot is going to that output, you have a failure if uh, uh, a cell that is not arriving that time slot is going to that output. Or if you have uh, no cells that that time slot are going to that output. Uh, so what is the probability that there is a cell arriving in each time slot uh, for a given output? Uh, we again assume that uh, all the time slots are identical and uh, independent uh, on a, a each other. So the probability that is, uh, uh, is uh, that the number of cells uh, arrived in a time slot uh, in uh, <coughs> a given, uh, for a given output i uh, is equal to key is uh, given by this uh, expression, where in this case uh, n is the number of uh, uh, inputs and outputs and uh, key is the number of cells that we want to count. And then we have, uh, so we assume that we have n inputs, and then we have this parameter p sub i, that is equal to p multiplied by this l sub i, where p is the offered uh, uh, load at any input, and we assume that all the inputs are equal, so the load is uh, evenly shared on all the inputs, and uh, L sub i is the probability that an arrived uh, cell is going to that specific output. So their product is uh, P sub i. Uh, again, we can assume that uh, the output port of this cell, uh, of each cell is a random variable, which is uh, uniformly distributed between uh, 1 and n, if we have uh, uh, one input or zero and n minus one. So if we if we have uh, n outputs, <clears throat> so if uh, we consider this uh, assumption, then uh, uh, li would be always equal to one divided by n, and uh, therefore p sub i becomes uh, p divided by uh, large n. If we replace uh, this uh, expression in the previous uh, uh, equation, uh, we, and uh, we, we assume that uh, n becomes, to, to, uh, becomes very large, then uh, uh, we notice that uh, we obtain the same expression as the Poisson process. So basically, the Bernoulli arrival process can be approximated by the Poisson process when uh, the number of uh, 
uh, inputs and outputs of the switch is uh, very large. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, lambda uh, multiplied by tau, that is the average number of packets that arrives in the same time slot, uh, will be equal to p. <coughs> tau is the duration of the time slot. So using this model, uh, the, the Bernoulli model, we can start uh, analyzing uh, the, the performance of the uh, of the switch uh, in uh, the uh, output port configuration, input port config, input uh, output buffer configuration, input buffer, and also shared buffer if you want. And we always want to evaluate the throughput. That this is the first parameter, and uh, we consider always n by n switching fabrics, so symmetrical switches. Uh, the switch capacity uh, is will be the maximum throughput, so the maximum value that we can obtain uh, of the throughput, and uh, we can assume infinite buffer capacities for to compare all these uh, uh, architectures. With infinite buffer capacities, you basically have uh, no packet loss, <laughs> but you can have infinite delay. The output buffer switch uh, is very simple to analyze because here we you don't have uh, head of the line blocking and assuming that you don't have uh, um, any internal blocking and the speed up factor can be equal to n, then the throughput will be always one. So it means that uh, uh, the, you you can have uh, uh, always packets that are going out of the output ports because you are always able to solve all the contentions. So all the packets that are going to a certain output port will be delivered there by the, um, by the, 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 the switching matrix. And then you have, there you have an infinite buffer. So these, bu these packets are already in the, the right position, so in the destination output port. Sooner or later, all the packets will be sent out from the same, uh, uh, from the correct uh, uh, output, and uh, the, the throughput is always one. So this is very simple. Uh, now we, we want to uh, instead investigate uh, uh, the other uh, architectures. In this case, we have to specify more about uh, the traffic so we need to refer to the Bernoulli traffic. Uh, we want to analyze the case where uh, the uh, input ports are always busy. So the probability of getting packets in in inside each input port is always one. Uh, or you are always a cell that is waiting in each uh, input buffer. And uh, whenever a cell is transmitted to a switch, a new cell immediately replaces the old cell at the head of the input queue. And then you have also a uniform uh, distribution of destinations. So what happens in the input buffer switch? Here we have uh, first in, first out buffers at the input. And uh, you have the head of the line blocking. So it means that uh, only the cells that are in a certain time slot at the head of the buffers will be potentially uh, transferred outside uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the output port. Uh, but since here you don't have any speed up factor, it means that only one of these cells can be transferred. So only one of these uh, cells are, is able to reach the output port. The other ones they remains uh, in the input in the input buffers. Uh, but uh, you have only to you just need to consider the head of the line cells. The other ones that are behind the head of the line cells. Uh, uh, will surely not be transferred in that specific time slot. When a head of the line cell uh, loses the contention, it blocks also other cells that are behind, so the maximum throughput will not be uh, surely 100. The analysis is uh, quite complicated. You can find the details uh, later on in the, uh, in, in the, in the slides, but uh, um, is just uh, for your curiosity, I will not ask the proof of this theorem. Uh, 
this is basically uh, what result the, the result these are the results of the theorem uh, here uh, in this table you find the maximum throughput against the size of the switch okay so if the size of the switch is one you have uh, obviously throughput one when the size of the switch uh, starts increasing the maximum throughput decreases until a certain uh, limiting uh, value the uh, uh, um, let's say uh, um, a limit value which is this uh, 0 0.586 uh, which is the, uh, the maximum throughput of the switch when you have an infinite dimension um, and uh, this this value is uh, quite rapidly uh, re reached as you increase the dimension so when you already have a, uh, a dimension of equal to 8 when you have a dimension equal to 8 uh, the, the value the maximum throughput is already quite close to what you have is, uh, with the infinite dimension so uh, actually uh, this is the, the, the maximum throughput that you can achieve with input buffers. If you compare it with uh, what happens without uh, any buffers, the unbuffered uh, performance, we found earlier that the, unbuffered, the, the throughput in the unbuffered performance is 0 0.632, which is larger than the throughput that you reach with the input queues. So a question is, uh, is it uh, worthwhile to spend to create uh, input queues if the throughput that you achieve is less than uh, uh, without any buffers? So what is the advantage of input queuing? And uh, the answer is that uh, the advantage is not in terms of uh, throughput, but in terms of packet loss. Because in case of uh, uh, the un unbuffered crossbar switch, uh, you have uh, uh, the, the packets that are not uh, uh, led to the output port are all lost. In case of uh, the input queuing, you will uh, uh, have packets uh, stored in the input buffers, so you don't lose packets. And uh, of course, uh, uh, if you have an infinite uh, uh, buffer capacity, you lose uh, no packets at all, uh, but if uh, your capacity is uh, uh, limited, the buffer capacity is limited, um, you, there is no closed uh, formula that allows you to calculate uh, the result, you have to perform simulations, this is the result, and uh, here you can see the curves of uh, packet loss probability as a function of the offered load with different sizes of buffers, and uh, this curve here is the bufferless case. In the bufferless case, you can see that uh, packet loss probability is always very high. Um, for example, uh, if you want to achieve uh, a pack packet loss probability of 10 to the minus 9, uh, you can do it uh, with a reasonable offered load with 8 buffer positions and even with a higher offered load with 16 buffer positions, but you will never reach it with uh, the, the crossbar. Okay, because in that case you use all the packets. So this is why uh, in the input uh, it's worthwhile to, to use uh, buffers at the input, not in terms of uh, uh, throughput, but in terms of packet loss probability. And this is another graph that uh, shows uh, packet loss probability for different uh, um, for different traf of the traffic values and for different size of the buffers. Okay, I stop here um, because then I will have a few slides more about uh, the other cases. Uh, if you go down to the to this part, you have uh, the uh, full analysis detail of the mathematical analysis, which is not so simple. And uh, so uh, next. Uh,